Okay, we're set. Thanks. All right, welcome back everyone. Um, our last paper of the program is titled Intraday Liquidity and Money Market Dislocations and Adrian will present. The screen is yours, Adrian. Thank you, Mike, Wenxin and Niels for selecting our paper, Intraday Liquidity and Money Market Dislocation. So this is joint work with Quentin van der Weyer. Now, Daryl actually did all the hard work of motivating this topic. This paper is basically a tentative of providing a theory to what he has just shown during his talk. Uh, as the focus of this talk is the existence of sporadic disruptions in money markets. As already shown by Daryl, most of the time repo rates trade within the Fed funds target range, but from time to time repo rates tend to spike upward to much higher rates. The support spikes appear to have recently increased in both size and frequency. And in particular, in the middle of September 2019, repo rate suddenly shot up to more than 6%. Now, the Fed knows that a spike in repo reflects a low pass-through of its monetary policy stance to firms at the core of the financial system. The Fed therefore changed course and reacted forcefully by stopping the tapering of QE. As of today, we still don't know what is driving precisely these sharp movements and whether it reflects structural fragilities in money markets. Among the potential explanations put forward by many par market participants is the notion that intraday liquidity suddenly started to matter due to recent changes in regulation. What's actually quite funny is that the quote we chose to illustrate our argument is in the same call and directly follows the quote of Darrow when someone after the answer that Darrow quoted insisted on understanding why JP Morgan did not lend more in September. So we have a hundred billion in our checking account at the Fed. It goes down to 60 billion and then back to 120 billion during the average day. But we believe the requirement under CLR and resolution and recovery is that we need enough in that account. So they, if there is extreme stress during the course of the day, it doesn't go below zero. If you ba go back to the, before the crisis, you would go below zero all the time during the day. So the question is, how hard is that as a red line? That will be up to regulators to decide. But right now, we have to meet those rules and we don't want to violate what we told them we are going to do. So that's in a nutshell, the objective of this paper, articulate and test the theory that limitation to intraday liquidity may indeed generate disruptions in money market. To do so, we develop a new macro banking model that we like to describe as a modernization of the seminal Arctic pool 1968 that we extend to include three main elements. First, we include a repo market in which banks trade liquidity with shadow banks. Second, we assume that transaction in the Fed funds and the repo market settles in reserves, meaning that the action of lending in this market triggers an outflow of reserve for banks. Usually macrofinance model are going to abstract from intraday flows. Here we characterize them precisely. Third, we assume that banks are subject to regulatory intraday stress test buffer, requiring them to prefund the expected gross daily outflows of reserves. Now, our first result is that the introduction of this intraday liquidity requirement constraint creates an elasticity in the supply curve for repo. Before the introduction of the regulation, banks could always borrow reserve by running an overdraft with the Fed. This means that the supply of intraday reserve would always elastically increase so that banks can always arbitrage away any spread between Fed funds and repo. In contrast, in a world with an intraday constraint, 
banks are required to always hold a positive balance of reserve at all point within the day. Banks then stop lending in repo when hitting the constraint, even for very high repo rates. And as shadow banks don't have the option to go to the discount window, repo rates can go to very high rates when shadow banks really need cash. Now, a certain result is that not only the supply of reserve that matters for the probability of seeing a repo spike, but rather the balance between the supply of reserve and the supply of treasuries. The reason is that treasuries are typically disproportionately financed by shadow banks, which increases the demand for repo. This result means that when the Fed tapers its balance sheet by selling treasury bond, it increases the pressure both on the demand and the supply of repo. Third, the model predicts that treasury yield would move upward when the economy moves to a regime in which a dislocation of the repo market is more likely. We think that this could play a role in explaining the pattern we observed in March of this year, when in the middle of a financial stress, a treasury yield increased rather than increased, decreased as Kieran mentioned uh, yesterday. So we see the main contribution of this paper as a theory of why intraday liquidity suddenly started to matter, also exploring how this new regime behaves to change in flows and stocks of treasuries. All right, so the model is in discrete time with two uh, sub periods, morning and afternoon. Variable and price is set in the morning and denoted with a minus subscript, while variable and price in the afternoon is denoted with a plus subscript. We have no nominal friction, only real prices, and there are three agents with net worth in the economy, risk neutral household, traditional, and shadow bankers. The aggregate uncertainty in this economy for the supply of repo in the afternoon comes from a liquidity preference shock of the household. And we also have a treasury and a central bank that issue uh, T-bonds and reserves. But they interact in different markets. In the morning, agent consume, trade T-bonds, issue deposit and purchase securities. In the afternoon, uh, the repo market clears, subject to the aggregate liquidity preference shock and traditional banks are subject to intraday flows of deposits and corresponding reserve due to the functioning of the payment system. Now, traditional bankers maximize the discounted flow of consumption subject to the balance sheet constraint and net worth law of motion. First, traditional bankers consume and invest in illiquid capital or loans. Now, in order to leverage, traditional banks can issue deposits. Importantly, issuing deposit makes you subject to flows during the day. And the more deposits you have, the more you are exposed to deposit flows. A fraction kappa P of repo does not roll over in the morning. And in the afternoon, after you invested in capital, you can lend reserves in two money markets, repo and the Fed funds market. Finally, reserves in this model are going to be the residual asset of your investment decisions, subject to deposit flows and lending in money market. If at the end of the day, your stock of reserves is below the required minimum, you're going to have to borrow at the rate RW um, at the Fed and fill the funding gap. Importantly, traditional banks are subject to financial regulation on bank stress testing and market liquidity. As mentioned, banks have to keep a minimum amount of reserves, otherwise they need to borrow at the discount window but they also need to have enough high quality liquid assets in the form of reserves and collateral to sustain a 30 day outflows of deposit where the size of these potential outflows is a parameter set by the regulator. However, and this is quite important by design, LCR is not changed by any short term lending or borrowing between financial institutions regardless of collateralization, as for example, reserves and the securities received in a reverse repo count equally as HQLA. So the focus of this paper is the recent introduction of intraday liquidity stress test that impose banks to keep an extra buffer of reserves above LCR to be able to cover intraday outflows of deposits. 
This buffer is calculated by model developed by each bank to account for the specificity of their business and needs to be approved by the regulator. These intraday liquidity stress tests were introduced in 2016 in a living will guidance of the Fed and referred to as the resolution liquidity adequacy and positioning. Finally, shadow banks cannot issue deposit hold reserves and trade in the Fed's fund market, but are not subject to liquidity regulations. They purchase treasuries in the morning with an overdraft at the clearing bank and they have to net the position with repo in the afternoon. They still have, if they still have a funding gap in the afternoon here in blue, then they need to pay an overnight credit penalty lambda from their clearing bank. More generally, we see this parameter as the ultimate cost for shadow banks of being short funds by the end of the day, which for example, for some head funds, uh, without clearing banks might imply rapidly having to sell some of their investments. Now, I won't have the time to go into detail of the problem of the other agents, but it is useful to have a look at the balance sheets of the economy. Household value liquidity services provided by deposit and repo, and it is the aggregate preference shock that will generate fluctuation in the relative demand for deposit in repo in the afternoon. Now, in reality, households don't invest directly in repo uh, through, but, but they do so through money mutual funds, which, which we abstract here from. Now, the treasury is going to issue treasury bonds that the bags by future taxes and going to hold reserves in the tre treasury general account at the Fed, while the central bank is simply going to issue reserves uh, to directly purchase uh, treasury bonds. Now, the core mechanism of the model can be illustrated with the shadow bank and traditional bank repo decisions. If the repo market rate is lower than the overnight credit charge, shadow bankers fund the investment um, in the repo market. If the repo rate spikes above Lambda, then shadow bank can simply prefer to pay that cost. Now to lend in the repo market, traditional bankers require a rate that compensate for the interest rate on the reserves, plus the probability of having to pay the discount window rate. This solution nests the traditional model of pool 1968. That is, if the liquidity stress test constraint is not binding, when banks are constrained by LST, repo rates can jump above the discount window rate. Now this leads us to our first result. We first look at an economy in which there is no LST constraint. Proposition one then tell us that the repo rate is always equal to the Fed funds rate. Without LST, banks are always able to arbitrage spreads between markets such that repo rates won't move away from Fed funds rate, which are bonded above by the discount window. And this graph illustrates this proposition. On the y-axis, you have the repo rate. On the x-axis, you have the repo volume. And the lower panel here shows what amount of reserves are available in the system and used in the repo market. For instance, here there is more reserve available than using for repo settlement. But the red line represents the supply of repo from traditional banks. Banks say trading off the risk of having to end up at this discount window with the IOR repo spread. The blue line is the excess demand from, for repo for, from shadow banks. That is the inelastic shadow bank demand to net the position and fund the overdraft minus the elastic supply by the household sector. When rates are higher, banks are willing to supply more. At the point where rates are as high as the discount window rate, banks are willing to supply any amount by running a negative overdraft, uh, negative balance of reserve and drawing on daylight overdraft at the Fed. So here the repo rate stays on target within the traditional Fed funds corridor. Now, when LST is binding, the repo rate is going to jump above the discount window rate outside of the corridor of the Fed, and there are no transactions in the Fed funds market. Importantly, 
Traditional bank cannot borrow at the discount window to arbitrage repo rates as the discount window opens at night and provides overnight liquidity, not intraday liquidity. In other words, the introduction of LSC removes the intraday elasticity of the currency that was used to be provided by the Fed. This graph illustrates what the post Basel III world looks like most of the time. First, there is much more reserves available than before the crisis, but a large chunk of this are actually locked in to meet the LST requirements represented in red right here. And once they bank, have five minutes from now. Once banks reach their regulatory threshold, they just stop lending in the repo market, which creates an elastic kink in the repo supply. Now, most days, the quantity of reserve needed to settle repo rates is sufficient, such that the market clears before hitting the regulatory constraint, and we do not observe repo spikes. Now, when the liquidity preference shock is such that cash instead of repo is in excess demand, the, the repo demand can hit the, this inelastic kink uh, of the repo supply and repo rates jump above the discount window. So now we can look at how different variables in the model can affect the probability of a, of a spike happening in the afternoon. In particular, our second result points to fiscal policy and treasury issuance as an essential variable. We find that an increase in the quantity of treasury bonds in yields a surge in the probability of a repo spike to three channels. First, because in our model, treasuries are held exclusively by shadow banks, an increase in the supply of treasuries results in an increase in the demand for shadow bank repo financing. And that's what we see. I don't have the graph. And that's what we actually see um, in this graph. Yes, starting from the balance sheet I've already shown earlier, there is no an increase in the supply of treasury bond and future taxes, which are going to result in an increase of deposits at banks and treasury bond, bonds um, at shadow banks. As a consequence, shadow banks end up borrowing much more repo uh, from banks. Now, interestingly, we can observe a similar partner in the run-up of September 2019. That's a graph that Daryl actually already showed us with shadow banks increasing their treasury holding sharply. And that's what we see here with the yellow line uh, moving up, while banks uh, also increase their repo lending um, in the blue line. So the second mechanism is that a larger issu spot issuance of T-bonds increases the settlement needs for reserves. Because there are larger anticipated outflows, the liquidity stress test becomes more stringent and there are less excess reserves available for repo lending. And third, a larger treasury account balance directly decreases the supply of reserves available to banks. So now we can turn to our last result, which is the direct effect of monetary policy. Proposition uh, 4 tells us that with LST, a reduction of the central bank T-bond portfolio lead to an increase in the probability of our repo spikes for two reasons. First, because doing so directly reduced the quantity of reserves. And second, because it also increased the quantity of treasury bonds that have to be absorbed by shadow banks and therefore also increased the repo de demand as we have seen earlier. Now, this pattern can be seen and observed when looking at the liability side of the Fed's balance sheet. Starting in 2019, the Fed reduced its balance sheet and reserve were destroyed. We can also see the effect of a growing treasury general account in gray in removing further reserves for banks. As a consequence, in September 2019, the level of reserves was at its lowest point since 2011. Now, our last result concern the treasury bond yields. Proposition five tells us that treasury bond yields are increasing in the probability of a spike. This result is actually quite intuitive. Shadow banks factor the fact that they finance treasury bond holdings in repo market and therefore require a larger liquidity premium for holding T-bonds 
when they think and expect that the ripple market is likely to get disrupted soon. In other words, the moneyness of treasury comes from the fact that it can be used as collateral in a ripple market. So in this paper, we propose a new macro banking model that can rationalize recent money market disruption as a consequence of an intraday liquidity constraint. Rather than being a simple technical issue in the implementation of monetary policy, we think about this as revealing important vulnerabilities, in particular with respect with liquidity backstops that were designed for banks in a financial system that is more and more market-based and globalized. So this paper in the end also highlights the importance for the Fed of main maintaining a repo facility with a larger set of counterparts beyond traditional banks. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Adrian. Um, please unshare your slides and our discussion for the paper is Arvind Krishnamurthy. And Arvind, the screen is yours. Okay, perfect. I'm just sharing my slide right now. All right. Um, I can't see myself. Does that look okay? All right, perfect. Thank you. Uh, all right. So you're, this is the third um, uh, person who's going to be talking about reserves, repo, and money markets. And um, I just wanted to say, uh, uh, spend just a minute saying, I think this is actually, uh, these issues are quite important. Um, the uh, the repo market is a part of a larger market, which is the short-term debt market, which is uh, a very large market, 10 to $20 trillion market, which is both a, a place in which um, uh, some participants are using the market for payment liquidity purposes, others are using it for store of value purposes, and then, and then it's also a source of leverage for uh, the uh, financial sector. So understanding the forces at work in this market are quite important to uh, uh, basically to corporate finance, uh, banking, as well as asset pricing. The prices in this market, the repo rate, as well as other short-term money market rates are central to uh, many other asset markets. Actually, one of the points that uh, Adrian just made is how is connecting the repo spikes to treasury bond uh, interest rates. Um, and so you should think more broadly that what's happening here affects the prices of other financial assets, yield curves. Uh, Wenshin in her work has shown how these rates are also central to thinking about foreign exchange markets uh, and the value of, of the dollar. Uh, so that's another connection that uh, for why these markets are interesting. And then um, what should have been very clear from uh, um, uh, both the discussions today, both the presentations today is this is also central to monetary policy transmission. So with that, let me just jump in here. Uh, this is the motivation of the paper. Uh, it's the repo spikes. Uh, Daryl mentioned this and Adrian also mentioned this. Uh, I'll come back and talk about this picture in a bit more. Uh, the outline of my discussion is I want to uh, talk about the money market pre-2008 versus the money market post-2008. That's in a way the heart of the analysis of the paper. What, what happened in the world um, um, from before 2008 to the present that we are seeing these types of spikes. And what this paper really tells us is, it, I think it pinpoints for us exactly what it is that changed. So that's that's the bulk of what I'm gonna talk about today. And then I want to uh, step back and talk a little bit more about just safe asset demand and uh, financial regulation. All right, so this is the, if you want the standard money and banking uh, picture that uh, I'm sure some of you have seen for analyzing um, uh, interest rate markets, the, the Fed funds market. Uh, the pre-2008 money market model is a model in which the total supply of reserves, so the, um, the total supply of reserves that the Fed put into the system was on the order of $50 billion. Now you have seen uh, both Daryl and Adrian mentioned that right now we're running at much higher reserve balances, two to $3 trillion. Um, and we ran down to one and a half trillion, at which point it looked like repo started to spike. But in the pre-crisis period, pre-2008, the total supply of reserves was quite small. There was a small supply of reserves, about 50 billion. The demand for reserves from banks came from depository reserve requirements, as well as a need to hold reserves for liquidity and payment needs. Uh, 
banks would trade these reserves amongst themselves. Uh, that would set the uh, interbank interest rate, the Fed funds rate, which is roughly the repo rate. Uh, if uh, uh, demands got sufficiently high, then banks could also go to the Fed and borrow from the discount window. That's the uh, uh, horizontal uh, elastic supply portion of this uh, reserve supply curve. So ID is the discount rate there. Intraday dynamics uh, pre-2008 uh, were have been quite different than post-2008. So this is a picture from a paper by uh, McAndrews and Ski and uh, analyzing uh, intraday behavior of the Fed funds market relative to the target at different timestamps over the day. So uh, 12 here is noon, uh, 18 here is, uh, uh, is 6 p.m. And the way the interbank market uh, traded uh, pre-2008, uh, let's just track along. If you just follow me along on the, the green line here, uh, just above zero, from roughly noon to 5 p.m., 6 p.m., the uh, interbank interest rate on average traded quite close to uh, the target range. So the green line is the 95th percentile uh, pre-August 9th. August 9th is the start of the uh, US financial crisis uh, in 2007, trades quite close to target. And right at the end of the day, there's a tail event where interest rates can spike. And the reason for that is that that's a time late in the day at which uh, banks are in the market trying to sort out their liquidity. There's a chance that's, that there's an imbalance in the system. So interest rates starts rising and they start rising. And the highest they can rise is to the outside option, which is to go to the Fed to borrow at the discount window. Okay. I want to uh, emphasize here in this picture how limited the uh, volatility of the interbank rate is in the day until about 5.30. And this, the, 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 the thing that's happening in, this, in the world um, in this period is not different than what's happening in the world currently. That is, there's a lot of payment flows by the non-bank sector that's moving around banks as reserve balances. Um, but for the most part, banks are not settling their reserve accounts continuously over the course of the day. They're running positions which are very positive, running positions which are very negative, and that all they're letting that positions move around over the, the course of the day until 5.30 when they realize at the end of the day, they need to settle their reserve accounts. They have to end up with a positive reserve balance so that you get some movement in the Fed funds rate at some tail event, um, which is reflecting in that uh, blue and uh, green line. Okay, I'll come back and, and uh, 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 contrast this with the present situation. And the, the, what you will see is that the difference between what's happening here and the present situation is that in, uh, in this pre-2008 period, banks could run uh, negative reserve balances over the day. Or another way of saying that is they could, they, they could have run an overdraft from the Fed uh, during the day. And so it, they didn't f uh, face a sort of a binding constraint every second of the day. And that's one of the main points that's made in this paper that uh, comes out also in this picture. The graph also shows you uh, pre-August 9th, which is pre the start of the financial crisis and post August 9th, you'll see that the, the spiky behavior at the end of the day is higher post. And that's another reflection of stress shows up in this market, uh, larger stresses show up in this market in the behavior of the uh, interbank interest rate. Okay, so what have we seen since 2008? We've seen that the supply of reserves have moves, has moved dramatically to the right. Um, and the second thing which we've seen is that the Fed pays interest on reserves. That, that lower line on my uh, graph here is the interest on reserves rate. And <clears throat> for the most part, uh, post-2008, it's the interest on reserves rate, which is the active tool that the Fed has used to uh, set the interbank interest rate. And that almost necessarily has to happen once you hit an era of uh, large reserve balances. The second thing that has uh, changed uh, uh, since 2008 is changes on not just the supply of reserves, not just the way the Fed is setting reserve supply, but also in the way that banks need reserves, the demand for reserves. And there are a couple of changes. First of all, currently we have no depository reserve requirements. The sort of old style fraction of reserves against deposits is gone. Um, banks still have liquidity payment needs. There's a new effective reserve requirements, which is a broader reserve requirement called the liquidity coverage ratio in which um, you have to meet a fraction of uh, your deposits, both um, 
uh, retail as well as wholesale, but you can meet it by holding both reserves as well as treasuries, uh, what's called high, high quality liquid assets. And then there's this intraday liquidity stress requirement uh, that Adrian mentioned. Okay, so those are a couple of new changes in reserve demand. And the second and the last thing to mention here uh, is that there's a cap on intraday overdrafts to the Fed. So the banks can't run um, large negative balances with the Fed over the course of the day. So the paper's analysis basically is, um, I'd say it's, it's uh, it, to me, it answers a couple of questions. It answers the question of why has repo spiked with some frequency uh, in 2019 in particular? Um, why above the discount rate? Um, Pre-2008, there was lots of volatility in the Fed funds market. Interbank interest rates would spike. They would spike late in the day, but they would be capped at the discount rate. Um, so why is that happening now? And uh, why with Apple reserves, do we hit the situation? You might've thought that pre 2008 with scarce reserves, we'd have hit the situation much more, but we didn't, we were we're hitting the situation much more at the present. And so what the paper puts uh, uh, forward is a model which embeds the main features of the post-crisis regime, uh, both in terms of the supply, as well as the demands, the set of regulatory restrictions that banks have to face um, to clarify what's going on. And the answer, uh, as Adrian uh, made clear, is it's this intraday liquidity requirement and the restriction on daylight overdraft drafts. That's the real culprit of what's happening uh, in the money market. So let me just talk through that, just review really the analysis that's done in the paper. Um, okay, so this is the supply curve um, and demand curve post 2008. We have a set of new uh, requirements that banks have to meet in terms of their holding of reserves. Uh, the liquidity coverage ratio can be met both with treasuries as well as reserves. So it, it, uh, it equally uh, affects both treasuries and reserves. So it perhaps pushes up reserve demand, but it could also push up, push up treasury demand. And that's something I'm gonna come back and talk about. The intraday liquidity stress requirement is a requirement that is specifically on reserves and it's this, it's this, uh, this quote that uh, both uh, Daryl as well as Adrian put up from uh, Jamie Dimon saying, I don't wanna run my reserve balances uh, too low. So both of those are forces that push up uh, reserve demand uh, relative to uh, pre-crisis and significantly so. These uh, requirements post-crisis uh, involve magnitudes that are not in 50 billion, but in terms of magnitudes uh, of holding total reserves in the in uh, in excess of a trillion, so there's a there's a lot of need here that's uh, floating around with these new requirements. Uh, <clears throat> the 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 second thing that shows up is when you push reserve demand up, the reserve demand curve intersects the reserve supply curve at a more sloped part of the reserve demand curve. Okay, uh, what I mean by that is if reserve demands are relatively low and reserve supply is very high, then at the, the margin of intersection of demand and supply will be a point at which demand curve is very elastic. Whereas with new requirements, as demands have shifted up, the, uh, the intersection point of demand and supply is a point in which um, demand is much more sloped. And, what, and the reason that's important is because shocks to reserve demand now uh, show up as movements in interest rates, okay? Um, and what are those shocks? Well, among the shocks are the shocks that uh, Adrian and Quentin point out, which is uh, uh, things like increased treasury issuance, which shows up as uh, increased needs for financing repo by uh, non-banks, uh, increases in the holdings of the US treasury and its TGA account, those are among the shocks, but one could think of other reserve demand shocks. I put up the uh, the pre and post nine uh, pre and post um, 2008 uh, behavior of, uh, uh, of of the interbank market uh, earlier. The McAndrews and Ski paper stresses generally in money market will show up as stresses in reserve demand shocks uh, in in reserve demand, and all of this will make reserve demand more unstable and will show up as movements in the Fed funds rate. This is a, a picture from, this is actually from the, the paper that uh, Daryl pre was presenting earlier. This is from Copeland Duffy and Yang. This is the intraday behavior of 
the repo rate relative to IOER, relative to the Fed's target rate, both on crunch days in red as well as normal days in blue. Um, and so you should think of this as analogous to what I was showing you before on the intraday behavior of the Fed funds rate relative to the target. And one of the things you can see very clearly here is that that red line shows stress in the repo rate throughout the day. Starting in the morning, you see movements um, uh, away from target rates on crunch days. Whereas what we had seen previously in the pre-2008 period is very little stress in the, in, during the day, but some stress at the end of the day uh, when banks needed to meet um, to balance their reserve positions. So, and the other we thing to emphasize- from now. Yeah. Thanks, Renshin. The other thing to emphasize here is these spikes are quite substantial. And the magnitudes here, 50 basis points to 350 basis points imply that the repo rate is spiking above the discount rate. The discount rate in, in most of this period is set at a level of 25 to 50 basis points above um, target Fed funds. So this is repo rate spiking above target, uh, above discount, which wouldn't have happened in the pre-2008 period. Okay, so the, uh, if you want the, the, the last main result uh, I take away from this paper is that the, uh, the liquidity stress requirement and the cap on daylight overdrafts basically means that within a day, the supply curve of reserves is completely inelastic. Um, and so as demand starts to shift up, say at 8 a.m., it means that the interbank interest rate can clear at a rate much higher than the discount rate. You can't, which you would have done uh, pre-2008. What you would have done pre-2008 is as the interest rate in the middle of the day starts to, to rise, say above the, the discount rate, you would run an interest you would run a daylight overdraft. Basically, you'd effectively run a negative balance and then you'd make up for it by borrowing from the Fed at the discount rate. And that behavior, that intraday arbitrage behavior would cap the interbank interest rate at the discount rate. That's not possible anymore. Uh, that's the cap. And so that allows the, the, uh, um, the interbank interest rate to rise uh, to above the discount rate. Okay, so let me just make a couple of comments. Um, this is, a, it's a, this is a very useful analysis. It, it sort of puts all of the main regulatory and supply changes on the table uh, and tries to tell us what it is that is going on. Um, the result, uh, if you want, the, the strongest result of the paper are that these intraday dynamics are, are the thing that's best explicated by uh, thinking about their analysis. The paper itself builds apparatus in many different directions. Um, and my, my suggestion from a modeling standpoint is there's a lot of apparatus that's built up, for example, and closing the government's budget constraint uh, in general equilibrium, which I don't find to be particularly um, at the heart of the result. I would suggest that you build a model more in the direction of expanding intraday dynamics, uh, because that's really what this paper is about and connecting, for example, more to some of the data that uh, Daryl had showed us uh, earlier in the day. So I'd like to see you show me a model that can track how uh, repo rates are behaving from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, and connect that to shocks happening at different times of the day, things about uh, anticipation effects, that type of stuff. So that's my, my main suggestion in terms of modeling. The second uh, thing that I would, uh, urge you guys to think about is to talk a little bit about what about other money market rates. So you focus very, very much on the repo rate and you talk about the Fed funds rate in the paper as well. And in this paper, the Fed funds rate and the repo rate are gonna basically gonna move in line with each other, but there's lots of interest rates. So here's a graph of interest rates on commercial paper, on repo, uh, on treasuries. All of these are moving together um, some of them, those spike, the repo rate spikes. So why does the repo rate spike and the, the overnight commercial paper doesn't? It would be uh, helpful uh, if you expand some of the institutional structure to, to connect up uh, different interest rates in this money market to tell us why it is that some things cause some stuff to spike and some things call, cause other stuff not to spike. For example, again, this is the paper that uh, Wenshin has with Korea and Du. Uh, talks about the connection of uh, what's happening in repo to what's happening in the, for, in the FX forward market. And the connection there is really through dealer um, uh, behavior. Uh, 
but there's other money market rates that I would love to see connected as well. Um, a third point, and this is really about intraday dynamics as well, is this is a paper which doesn't think about the distribution of reserves. Kind of all reserves are in the banking sector are compiled to V1, but I am, I mean, you, you sort of saw this from what Daryl presented earlier. It's clear the distribution is matters and that also needs to be thought about. Um, let me uh, end with uh, this picture. If you sort of step back from uh, this paper, as well as um, really the presentation that uh, Daryl presented at the start, the, there's a set of requirements that have been uh, put on the banking sector post-crisis. These are liquidity requirements, and they're requirements that all move in the direction of having banks need to hold many more reserves now than they did uh, pre-crisis. Pre-crisis banks, as I showed you, were getting away with holding something like $50 billion of reserves. Now, apparently banks need to hold $2 trillion of reserves. Reserves are the liability of the government. Um, and broadly speaking, the expansion in banks' requirement to hold reserves is an expansion in the financial sector's um, requirement to hold government liabilities. And that is a, a, a significant change in the world over the last 15 years. So what I'm graphing here um, the, is um, the, the first red line is the, this is the, the picture that I have in my paper with Annette on um, uh, the, the, the relation between treasury supply and what we think of as a convenience yield on treasuries. And uh, I've, also graphed suggestively a set of uh, figure, a set of uh, dots post 2008 and drawn a line through it, which is indicative or should make you think that what's happened in the world is that the demand for uh, safe treasury bonds has shifted out uh, pretty significantly um, in the last 15 years and you know, the, the set of requirements that have been put in place are part of the reasons why this has shifted out. We, we are on net having to hold, banks are net having to hold an extra trillion dollars of reserves. And so uh, when the Fed goes out and does QE and, and puts reserves on banks, what they're effectively doing is they're making sure that the, uh, they're able to finance a larger amount of debt with, uh, by forcing banks to hold more. Um, and just stepping back, that's something to also think about. Do we, is it, is this from a sort of a, a social planner perspective, are these requirements doing something actually useful in the world or are they just uh, allowing the US government to fund itself uh, cheaper? So I'm gonna stop there. Um, Great. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you so much. Um, so I guess we can have uh, Adrian and Quentin to respond for a very brief way, two to three minutes, and then we can um, invite audience to ask more questions. Uh, please feel free to type in your question in the chat box. Yes. Um, thank you so much for the great discussion. I think you made a wonderful job at clarifying many uh, very important points. So let me go very quickly through some of the common require regarding the reserve requirement. It's true, we should have it uh, at zero, for example, with a non-negativity constraint maybe. What, what we really wanted here is to still nest the model of pool um, in our framework. Um, regarding um, the timing of the different flows, I think uh, it, it was great to, to show us, um, I mean, contrasting the McAndrew sky chart for intraday Fed funds rates with the graph that Daryl showed us um, is great. It makes the point that cash can be scarce really within the day and that it's really intraday liquidity that seems to be uh, under pressure. Um, concerning the, the general equilibrium, um, I think, it, yeah, it's a, it's a great comment. I think we need to really push into the micro foundation of what's really happening during the day with these in different intraday flows. Um, I think the benefits here of the general equilibrium apparatus, at least starting with, with that framework, is that it helps us to think consistently about the different changes in various aggregate variables that can affect the probability of entering on this constrained regime and also have consistent flows across all the different transactions that happens between the treasury general account, the, the, the treasury, the, the government, uh, the shadow bank, and um, the, the, 
the traditional banks. Regarding the other mark, money market rates, um, absolutely. I think that's, uh, that's uh, a little bit still uh, of a puzzle or a very interesting um, question to tackle. What exactly are the institutional details that makes Ripple more liquid or more attractive to, um, you know, to address uh, short-term liquidity or intraday liquidity needs that, for example, other um, assets might not be able to, and, and therefore why, why we see the spike in Ripple market and not in some other short-term um, asset. Regarding the distribution of reserves, uh, we're thinking um, in the future maybe to add uh, search friction with a fixed cost of entering in the business of repo intermediation. And this might generate naturally an advantage of having one big one centralized uh, repo desk as uh, we observed uh, currently. Great. Um, okay, so we have a first question from Andrea Eisfeld. Do you want to ask the question, Andrea, live? Oh, sure. Um, I was, I, this is a question I also was thinking about in Daryl's talk, which is just, um, and thank you, what is, you know, what are driving these shocks? What does the shock process look like? So if we're trying to understand what the shadow cost of this constraint is, uh, we want to know as much as we can about where these shocks are coming from, like, you know, what's their, like, time series process. Is Quentin, you wanna give a shot on this one? Yes, maybe I can answer to that one. So I think there are different shocks uh, that, that can potentially affect the, the moving to this kind of regime where you have an actual constraint on the, on the intraday liquidity. I think uh, one is definitely what happens on quarter ends, which seems to be that, that's something that Daryl mentioned that we, we did not explore um, so much that so basically on quarter ends, um, foreign banks tend to withdraw cash from the repo market, and apparently they do that for um, um, window dressing reasons that they have to they have to abide to some regulatory constraint on that particular day. So they want so they want to make the balance sheet looks nice. So this would be what, what one um, example of a shock. But but you you also have other shocks, which for instance could be. Uh, everything that makes the flows of um, of uh, intraday cash moving faster. So you can think about the issuance of treasury. That's something that we mentioned uh, during uh, during the paper. But also the the set the set large large settlement volumes or or even um, uh, tax tax settlement dates uh, seems to be uh, also also days in which uh, stress seems to appear. Great. Um, okay, so next one is um, Daryl. You want to ask another question? <laughs> I was. I, I think, given the attention to this and the size of the Fed's balance sheet, I, it's an interesting counterfactual to ask: What would have happened if, in September two thousand nineteen, the Fed had not flooded the market with lots of additional reserves? And let me speculate. Um, well, the, some small repo counterparties would have failed because they wouldn't have been able to finance their treasuries. Probably the world would continue uh, with disrupted monetary policy. And probably a lot of the banks that were not active in the market, consistent with Adriana's last comment, would have overcome the, uh, the costs of starting to participate because there was a ton of reserves in the market that were just dormant. And so, you know, maybe the, trans the transition costs are big. Uh, but maybe there's a world in which once you uh, overcome those transition costs, it's not so bad and the Fed doesn't need a huge balance sheet. There are many that say the Fed should not have a huge balance sheet. Absolutely. I think that's a great comment. I think he talks about um, having the Fed become a lender of last resort and maybe um, having the, the, the private market uh, instead uh, being more resilient to this type of volatility that we actually, I think, used to see before the financial crisis and we don't see that much. So in, in the extension, we suggest having, for example, this probability for repo rate increase on average uh, would indeed uh, drive other actors to tend to arbitrage this uh, sudden shock. And then maybe the, the, the private market would be itself able to tackle these uh, uh, fragilities. Great, 
Great. I guess we're right on time to conclude the program. So finally, Mike has a few uh, brief concluding remarks. Uh, I just want to thank everybody, all the presenters, all the discussants for the great participation, Daryl, for the great keynote. And also we thank all the participants for your engagement in this kind of difficult format. We really appreciate all the questions and all the comments. So I guess you, you will be hearing from us in due time about our next workshop. Thank you very much. And, and let me just add thank you to uh, Wenchen and Niels and Mike for organizing a great, uh, great meeting, putting together a great program. Uh, to Lars for all the great support and uh, Valentina Solana at BFI doing all the hard work actually making this uh, thing um, viable and working and streaming and recording and everything. So thank you. Thank you guys on behalf of the society and everyone here. So great applause to everyone.